Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 124. Yay! How, how difficult do we think it is, actually? A little bit of looking up beforehand. Work out, which episode are we on? It's the, the most basic research that we could do. <laughs> the hours that we spend pouring through sources and books and articles, we don't ever think to check what bloody number, what number we're, we're on <laughs> because it's all just a haze it is a mad haze of craziness honestly people listen back to some of the episodes you will hear a slight difference mm. in the number <laughs> episode i'm reading out because i've had to re-record it right at the last minute because like oh none of that was right none of that's right it's all entirely wrong one of them went out with the wrong number on it had to correct that on the in- on the instagram <laughs> <laughs> oh, how are you, Nick? I'm all right. Hot, all right. Hot and sweaty. It, it went fine. It went cool for a bit. Mm. Now it's got hot and sweaty. Don't Thunderstorms like are coming, though. Oh, well, that's what they say. Autumn that's is what coming. They say. Oh, come on, can't get here fast enough. It is. It's about what was we got just just over a week until September, and then spooky bitch season starts. Spooky bitch season. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be pumpkins everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Boots and scarves, no matter how hot it is. <laughs> From that point, it gets dark at six. <laughs> <laughs> Constant thunderstorms. Bonfires as far as the eye can see. As it should be. Covered in pumpkin spice latte. Oh, I can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I have a feeling this is not going to be going anytime soon. I might have to immerse in a fan. Have you still not got a fan? I've not got a fan. Not got a fan. Not got a fan. Not a fan of a fan. fan. (laughs) Expensive fans. Expensive fans. You will get the most expensive fan. Not expensive to run. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Electricity (laughs) monies. Can't be affording that now. Yeah, get it all in before October, mate. Yeah, this is true. Over in England, we're about to hit a massive energy and cost of living crisis. So all of the spending before October. And then we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. (laughs) Absolutely. No no, no lights, no no fans, no lights. I'm sensing in October it won't be as hot, but maybe the universe wants to fuck us over on this one. Maybe so. Sorry, Les. (laughs) Uh, any poisonings this week? I don't believe so. It's too hot and too sweaty for such things. You're blinded by sweat. Blinded. I, my, my eyeballs are sweaty. I don't like it. <laughs> I, bet I should stop using antiperspirant, I feel. Because obviously... I don't. No. But no. I think this through. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I think I like to use antiperspirant like under your arms and things. But I think it just comes out elsewhere. That is true. So yeah, I think if it you... now doesn't come out under my arms and things. It now comes out through my eyes. <laughs> so, well, my yeah, hair it... is sweaty. How does that work? <laughs> The whole of your head is <laughs> just, just seeping just sweat. It's like, this is not pleasant. But the good thing is that your armpits are bone dry. Yeah, absolutely. I'm fresh and fragrant under exactly. my arms. <laughs> the rest it's of me. Uh. <laughs> but my back is sweating. I know. It's not good. And it's going places that I don't want it to go. <laughs> into, into my lovely upholstered chairs. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> Have some sort of bin bags are in order. <laughs> Speaking of sweating profusely on your friend's chairs. And being blinded so you can't see who you're poisoning. I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Oh, yes, we most certainly should. Thank you very much to Juliana Middick. To Samantha Lewis. To Laura Sewell. Sophie. And to Pearl Umbra. Thank you very much, you lovely people. Very, very sexy Patreon subscribers. Well, we've had fun on Patreon this week. Had another little uh, duo tales from Compendium, Nick. A Victorian compendium of murderiness. Yes, interesting one this week as well. Was a thinker. Was a thinker. Was a puzzler. A matter for debate. Indeed. And one that was very cut and dried, like, oh, he did and it. one that was like, oh, no, he definitely, oh, yeah, he definitely, <laughs> definitely did it. Yes. yes, lots of fun over on Patreon and new episodes of the Case Files of PC Morris coming out this month where we discuss weird and crazy stories from around the world, modern news stories and old ones diving into the slightly insane and anything that makes us laugh, really. If anyone has their own sort of WTF stories that they want to share or crazy stories that have happened to them and they would like us to read them out on the Cyanide Connoisseurs episodes, please send them in via DM. We'd love to hear from you. And we have a little shout out this week as well. But I'm going to do. Not Sinead. It's mine. I'm going to do it. Because I want to. And it's on my phone. And I made him. And she, Sinead said I had to do it because she was after me otherwise. But we have a shout out for Claire. Claire Hossack, one of our lovely Patreon members as well, who is, was celebrating their wedding anniversary on the 21st. Under the 21st, just gone. Merry anniversary to you and Andy. I hope you had many a fantastic cocktail. Hooray, hooray, hooray for your wedding anniversary. Do we know what the 21st anniversary is? Oh, no, like... no, it was on the 21st. It was their first wedding anniversary oh! on the 21st. Right, I thought they'd been married for 21 years. <laughs> on the 21st and, and and obviously that doesn't work 
work. <laughs> <laughs> That's just mad. The one th- anniversary. The one th- anniversary. Paper. Paper. Is that paper? Is that so? It is paper. That's it's the one, one that people one, remember. <laughs> it was your anniversary recently. It was my anniversary. And I entirely forgot. Yeah, you did. Everyone forgot. Yes. <laughs> did you forget? No. <laughs> <laughs> Merry anniversary. And it's leather. Oh, fun. Fun times for all. <laughs> you see, everyone goes to that when it's yeah. me. Everyone else, like handbag or something like that. Yeah. Oh, leather. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, we got back from the festival. We had some champagne the night before and we just went, oh, Merry anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> leather? Been, no. Been remember. together 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick, mm-hmm. are you ready? Uh, okay. To drink cocktails and talk about poison. Again, with the drama. So much drama. I'm not hearing an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could go with a cocktail. Or, though I'm slightly terrified of the cocktail, we could drink poison and talk about cocktails I, and forget that ever happened. Well, to us, I think this week might be the week we're doing both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a treat in store this week because it's my episodes, so my pick, hooray, hooray, hooray. But of course, we can't have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell, and it will flavor our cocktail of the week. So this week's secret ingredient, Nick, is... Hmm absinthe it had to get there eventually i'm surprised we haven't done it already i did look through every yeah. episode we have done a few absinthe cocktails that we have that we have and our regular listeners will know what happens <laughs> when we have an absinthe cocktail yeah, absolutely so this is going to be an interesting one indeed now we'll come on to the effects of absinthe <laughs> And why people think that this might be a dangerous thing for us to do. (laughs) Why this is an avenue we maybe shouldn't saunter down. Yet we're going to. But first, with absinthe then. Many, many cocktails out there. Some really famous ones. What have you come up with, Nick? Well, there are a lot of famous ones out there, absolutely. Because a lot of the ones we've had up until now with absinthe have always involved some absinthe rinses or dashes of absinthe and things like that. Wise. But I thought, no. Absinthe is the secret ingredient. Absinthe needs to be the star ingredient in this, not just a little side ingredient. Mm. This needs to be full on. It's where you're going to know you've had some absinthe. Oh, God, I'm really frightened. (laughs) (laughs) Because what what has happened to us when we've just had the rinses? Yeah, I mean, it's never it's never gone well. (laughs) Well, maybe we've had too little. And the secret is to have a lot. Have a lot. As Ernest Hemingway would have it. (laughs) Okay, so in that case, Nick. This week, we are going to have... Duchess. A duchess? A duchess. Oh, I quite like that. I know, I thought it sounded fancy. Like oh, it. yeah. I th- I see. I hear duchess, I think of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I think of... I've been called worse. Uh, I do think of Downton Abbey and Maggie Smith's yes, character, and yeah. that is basically you. <laughs> <laughs> a dowager duchess of Grantham. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Withering, just sitting there, bring me things. <laughs> if I could be Maggie Smith, happy with that. <laughs> she hates everyone, everyone loves her. It's great, it's perfect. <laughs> Sounds better, much like me. We've had some other famous though, absinthe thinking cocktails. Back, Maggie Smith, in fact, was in fact a countess, not a duchess. Duchess. Duchess is higher. Oh, is it, oh, Duke is, is the second highest so to Duke, Duke, Yeah, exactly. Duke and, Duke and Duchess are the highest non-royal Ooh. nobility you get. All right. Well, yeah. you don't rank Maggie Smith then. Oh, yes, indeed. In this fantasy world in that we've created. In this fantasy weird world that we've created. <laughs> Where you are a duchess. Where I'm a duchess. In the adjacent <laughs> mansion to Downton Abbey. Yeah. Which is oddly smaller but has far more drinks in it. Uh, yes, it's just one giant drinks cabinet. It's just one giant staircase. <laughs> <laughs> just up and down constantly. But I don't have servants. It's carrying me up and down constantly, so it's well, fine. Oh, no, of course, it's your finishing school. We've now gone from Art Gordon to Duchess Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> Who says Art Gordon wasn't a Duchess? Well, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> Though I, I do see somewhat the Duchess as being a somewhat imperious figure and Aunt Gordon being like the matron. Oh, okay, okay. Of the, of the establishment. I'm actually really invested in this story yeah, now. No. I forgot we were doing a podcast. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I can picture the mise en scène yeah, now. Marvellous. No. Okay, well, before any more of this Duchess talk goes on, but maybe this is what we'll carry on on Patreon. We'll just do the whole of the Aunt Gordon and the Duchess Gordon School of Hard Knocks. <laughs> That's a terrible title. It's, it's a really bad title. Look, it needs work. We're going to workshop it on Patreon. It needs a lot of work. But before we get to that, I think it is high time for us to glide Duchess-like into the Poisonous Cabinet Kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, the Duchess, the Duchess has graced us with her presence. She's arrived. Now, I don't know what I was expecting with the Duchess. Maybe something clear and crisp, but it's a brown or amber drink, which yeah. is good. Good sign. Mm-hmm. Normally, it's a good sign. Normally, it's a good sign. But you have promised an absinthe forward beverage. Mm. 
mm. and that makes me frightened. <laughs> <laughs> as well it should. Okay, so it's it's a quite a long drink as yeah. well. But we not only have the Duchess, we have decided, given that it is absinthe week, we have the traditional glass of absinthe in front of us with the special spoon and the sugar cube, yep. over which we shall drip some water. I shall drip some iced water over the course of the episode. Takes some time. The it dripping, does. So now, normally, what apparatus would you use for? Usually, you'd actually have like a little fountain type thing with, with ice water with a little tap that would just sit there and drip. I have got a tiny syringe. <laughs> and, a ju- and a jug of iced water. Yes, Nick has a small syringe, and I'm worried that that's been used for the cat's ear medicine or something. You saw it sealed up. It was all fresh. <laughs> I know, you also had a massive syringe in yeah. there, and I'm like, what the hell does he do with these? But yes, this is a, this is a clever solution. So you're going to drip, drip, drip. So I'll drip, drip, drip. You, you, you tell your story. I'll yes. drip, drip, drip. And once it has looshed, <laughs> I shall... Looshed. 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 Oh, that's shall, your word. I shall interrupt. We shall sample. But first of all, the Duchess requires attention, I feel. Greet the Duchess. Yes. What do you say to a Duchess? Was it Your like, Grace. Your Grace. Your Grace. Duchesses oh. and Dukes are Graces. The Duchess needs to be announced. Your Grace. <laughs> okay. To your good health, Indeed. sir. Oh, God. Okay. Ooh. That is surprisingly lovely. That's interesting. I That's wasn't d- expecting ooh. that. I was not expecting that. I was so ready <laughs> for just the hit of aniseed. Yeah flavor that absinthe has technically it's a nice but yeah we've mm. we've had absinthe before where it's overpowering that is a lovely lovely That's really good oh that is deliciousness in a glass excellent oh well done duchess oh the duchess has come <laughs> forth oh, we has. can see why she's the high ranking <laughs> so that's like oh how do i describe it the first words that come to my head are like a cherry bakewell it's got sort of a, a cherry almond it's got a sweetness but it's not overpowering uh, it's bizarre because there are none of those things in there, but I get where you're coming from. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> so, I mean, it does have a slightly fruity twang. It does. It's got. Have I made this very wrongly? Did you just improvise? In there? <laughs> I would have put good money on there being maraschino in there. Yeah, no, no maraschino. No maraschino. Nope. That is really confusing is, me. <laughs> I'm really pleased with that. That's really good. I'm pleased, but also very, very worried oh, yeah. now. It's, yeah, we're going to knock us back and then go mad. Talk us through it, because clearly I have no idea what's happening. So absinthe, surprisingly. Absinthe. There is absinthe in there. How much absinthe? Half an ounce of absinthe. Okay, half an ounce, not bad. Not I can bad. live with that. Live if it was two that. ounces, then I'd be tearing out my eyes. <laughs> we then have a sweet vermouth. Yeah. Where yeah. the brown is coming from. The brown. We have a dry vermouth. Nice. Ah. And some orange bitters. What? That's it. Story, story, sir. There you how are. how has this happened? That's it. That's it. You've got uh, you've got one and a half of the dry vermouth and one and a half of the sweet vermouth. Half yeah. an ounce of absinthe, a couple of dashes of bitters, which has balanced it out quite nicely. Now, the original mm. recipe for this, because this comes from sort of 1930s Savoy cocktail book, and it calls for equal parts of each. No. So I think one and a half ounces of absinthe in that no. would have been... Slightly over the top. So it's a different recipe that he's tweaked it and it has worked very well. I'm very impressed with that. That is well. Simon Difford knows what he is yeah. talking about, clearly. Yeah, now you've said it, you kind of go, okay, the, the dry vermouth, maybe there's the winey element mm. to it. But it, it's so fruity. It's fruity. None of that scary absinthe flavour yeah. that most people stay away from absinthe or any kind of perno or any of those sorts of drinks that have got a heavy anise flavour. It's not there. It's, 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 What's it, happening? It's, it's there, but it's, it's absolutely, as you say, it's not overpowering. And I think the other things are sort of bringing out more of the other the other botanicals in the anise in the um, mm. the absinthe. God, wow! Try it; it's amazing. Three ingredients, another testament to spirit forward. Three ingredients; that's all Ooh, you need. Good. Well, four ingredients yum, yum, technically. Yum, yum, yum. Oh my God, Nick! That is a resounding success. Yeah. Now, Nick is administering the first dosage of water <laughs> to the sugar cube. I'm, I'm going to take a picture. I'm dripping. This is going to take an absolute age. May have to invest in an absinthe fountain if this is good. <laughs> do you have to consistently do it? it just, yeah, it just needs dripping. You can't just and you can't go too fast because it doesn't soak into the sugar. You've got to do it slowly so it absorbs in, dissolves the sugar, and then drips through your spoon. Okay, well, with the Duchess firmly in hand, uh, if she will allow us to take her hand, are you ready for a story, Nick? Ooh, yes. So today I want to do something a bit different. I'm going to do an episode where we delve a little deeper, as we did at the beginning of the season with wallpaper and poisoning. I want to take some time to celebrate that infamous beverage absinthe this is an absinthe forward episode absinthe forward episode okay it is it's I'm all dedicated it. to this drink for today nick is national absinthe day is it indeed no it's not it's oh. the 5th of march is national absinthe day to me. <laughs> 
but absent, a drink that has been beloved and blasted in equal measures throughout the centuries. A drink that was banned in the USA until as recently as 2007 mm. and could not possibly adorn any bar shelf in Europe for more than a hundred years. Some say it is the nectar of the muses, a liquid source of inspiration for artists, for poets and for the dreamers of the world. Others say it is the devil's work, a medicinal tonic that has been abused by the degenerates of society and that its potency is responsible for mayhem, mischief, and even murder. Well, I should hope so. Why the hell not? <laughs> I do have a tale of murder for you this week, for it wouldn't be the Poisonous Cabinet without one. But first, I want to take a stroll down the corridors of history, which is a weird way of describing it really history. Is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. People do the corridors of history. I've well, never heard that before. No, I've heard it before, and I, I don't oh. understand why there's a corridor in history. Corridors of time. Corridors of time. Well, what's the difference? Corridors of time. Why is there a t- corridor in time? Is there a desk lamp of time? Yes, there is. Some arches. <laughs> Side table of history. A veranda of time. <laughs> And space. (laughs) Now, Nick, do you know about Absinthe's origins? Well, France, I believe. No. No. Got that wrong then. (laughs) Fallen at the first hurdle. I have. I failed miserably. I should go home. (laughs) Was that all you had? Just France? France. (laughs) Eastern Europe. Another another myth. Another myth. (laughs) Were you thinking like Czech Republic? I was thinking something like that, yeah. You would be right to think that and also wrong. Okay. (laughs) Nottingham. (laughs) <laughs> oh, the absinthe factories of Nottingham. Place. Satanic mills belching out absinthe. <laughs> this has started well. It's, it's going really well. <laughs> well, let's go right back to the origins of absinthe. And the name absinthe is the subject of quite a bit of debate. No one is quite sure if it's Greek or Persian in origin. But the most common explanation is that it is derived from the Greek word absintheon. Okay. Which means wormwood. Yes. Which is the main ingredient. Which is the main ingredient. Of absinthe. Wormwood also in Greek, I believe, some say, also means undrinkable. Ooh. And maybe that should serve as a warning enough when it comes (laughs) to absinthe. Wormwood is the main ingredient of absinthe and it is famously bitter. And way back... In the Egyptian times, we're going right back to 1550 BC. That's quite far back. It's it's farther than I can count. Back then, it was used for medicinal purposes. As you can imagine, wormwood extract and wine-soaked wormwood leaves would be used to settle upset stomachs. Nice. Cure flatulence. Excellent. Hippocrates apparently used wormwood, flavoured wine, as a medicine. You've got then it coming into the Romans, and the Romans giving children wormwood in cups that were flavoured with honey. So the first hint of this sugar Mm. sweetness being added to disguise the awful, awful bitter taste (laughs) of wormwood, because wormwood itself is disgusting. But if you are looking for bitter, herby, twiggy nonsense in a glass, early absinthe is your thing and you wouldn't much enjoy it. But it wasn't until the 18th century, 1700s, that one resourceful Frenchman living in Switzerland unknowingly knocked things up a notch. Well, he knowingly did it, but didn't know what he was going to, the legacy he was creating. Right. Just Mr. Perno or something. Oh, hang on to that thought. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you're not far off. But before Mr. Perno, before Mr. Perno, before Mr. Perno gets involved, you have Dr. Pierre Ordinaire. Oh, which is a made-up name if I've ever heard Mr. one. Mr. Ordinary. <laughs> it is. It's Mr. Peter Ordinary. Uh, Pierre Ordinaire. He really did exist. But he was a retired doctor living in Switzerland around 1792 because at the time France, uh, uh, no, don't want to live there because of the revolution. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not just oh, not, France is not shit. Not just because full of French. He is living in Switzerland in the town of Cuvée. And he began to craft a new health tonic using wormwood, already known for its medicinal qualities. But this time he found a way to make the tonic tastier and not so hideous. And so was born the beginnings of the absinthe we know and fear today. The combination of the grand wormwood plant and the main ingredients in absinthe are sweet fennel, and anise. Yep. Different from star anise, though star anise is used a lot in it, but that's what gives it that aniseed distinctive taste. His recipe added more botanicals, up to 15 botanicals, to grape spirit, including licorice, parsley, chamomile, coriander, all macerated and then distilled into this lovely tonic. It was sold under the name Bon Extract Absinthe. Good. Good, good extract. <laughs> good extract. Mal extract absinthe did not sell well, yeah. surprisingly enough. An all purpose remedy for anything. Whatever you need it for, Whatever it will you. kill you. Oh, it will yes. blow your head off. The recipe was passed to the 
Enriod sisters. Now, these sisters were apparently his housekeepers or they were women in the village. They continued to sell it after his death death and they called it uh, according to some sources Dr. Odenair absinthe. Some versions of the story have it that it was the sisters who invented the recipe for absinthe way back when and Dr. Odenair turned up and either stole it from them and started going yes I invented it I am a man I have absinthe or he worked with them so the little little conflicts mm, yeah. but these people did exist. But things changed when one major Daniel Henri Dubied arrived in Cuvée and sampled the tonic, and offered to buy the recipe and the whole business from the sisters. It would end up in 1797 that he opened the first absinthe distillery with his son Marcel and his son-in-law, Henri Louis Pernod. Ah, there yeah. he is. Famous Pernod Ricard company that it is now known as. In 1805, this huge distillery in Pontalier in France... They had a distillery in Switzerland, I believe. They started building up this empire and the mass production of the distinctive anise-flavoured absinthe begins. Mm -hmm. It grew massively in popularity because it started being given to soldiers who were going off to fight (laughs) various wars. Yep. (laughs) Not just good luck. Good luck. It was to prevent malaria. Oh, is that so? Yes. I did not know that at all. So whether it did prevent malaria, we don't know. We know that quinine is given yeah, was yeah. given to them for many Absolutely. years and tonic waters or gin and tonic. Before that, you had absinthe. Okay. And the soldiers came home and had developed a test for it. Or, or they would just be, throw them into battle. They're absolutely plastered. So it's, just, <laughs> it's the only way they're going to go and fight is they're, they're pissed. It ends up with there being demand back in France. So it starts in Switzerland. Production goes over to France. French soldiers coming back from the war going, oh, more of that absinthe, please. And then everyone gets in on it. So cafes and bars are selling it. And then every class mm. suddenly starts to want to have a glass of absinthe. Soon, 5 p.m., became known as l'heure the the green hour. The green hour. The green hour. As everyone went to their nearest bistro to partake of the green elixir. Now, sales were particularly helped at the time by around about a 20-year blight on French vineyards. <laughs> there is no wine. There is n- we must have something to drink. <laughs> there was no wine, no brandy. So- <laughs> there was a huge parasite destroying the vineyards Mr. in this Pernod. time. <laughs> Mr. Perno just fucking <laughs> out there hacking them down, disguised as a giant louse. <laughs> Nibbling away he was. This blight absolutely decimated it. So absinthe, way all the rage. It was cheaper as well, and it was getting easier and easier to find. It began to be exported to the USA, and that's where we have the invention of possibly the first ever absinthe cocktail, the Sazerac. Yes, indeed. Yes. We had, oh, not that long ago at all. Only but a couple. A few weeks ago, we had a Sazerac. In New Orleans, the Sazerac, and it is credited as possibly the first cocktail using absinthe. Trust you beautiful Americans to come (laughs) up with a splendid cocktail, whereas the French, knocking it back. Just knock it back and eat. Absolutely knocking it back. (laughs) Don't don't have time for that mixing malarkey. (laughs) It's a good time to check in. How is the water (laughs) Well, I'm almost almost dissolved. You are almost dissolved. I'm almost dissolved. I, the, the sugar cubes I, um, that we have are, are quite small, so I have used two. Yeah, good for you. So I did put quite a lot of absinthe in there. I had to run to a corner shop to find sugar so cubes, and I found I some. really down the louche that I was hoping it was going to. What would that look like? So it's where it goes sort of like a cloudy. And what that is, is a lot of the um, the minerals and things that are in the spirit, they don't like the water. They, they aren't dissolved. They, they dissolve in yes. alcohol. So when it when it's mixed with a lot of water, they come out sort of out of solution and make it go cloudy. Yeah. Um, and it's seen as a sign of uh, the high quality of absinthe. If you have if you Ooh. have to retain this this, and it's known as the louche. Oh, two things um, on that. Would you like more sugar cubes to help with the louche? Would that help? I don't think so. So the sugar the sugar cubes are there to make it to make it palatable. The water that's taking the things out of solution in the alcohol there was a story with absinthe which i didn't write down i'm going to paraphrase very quickly that absinthe helped someone who was trying to determine this where a water source from a river was coming from because it was near one of the absinthe distilleries there was a massive fire they had to tip out all of the absinthe into the river and because the water and the absinthe contact the looshing yeah it, actually, the person who was studying it was like, oh, I can see where the you water can, yeah. source is coming from. So, ah, ha, ha, ha. So that's what it is. It has vaguely happened. It yes, is, it does it has, look cloudier now. It has gone, it has gone cloudy. Ooh. Certainly not the, the clear crystal 
screen that we had. All right. Well, we'll come before. to that. Come to that shortly. So, yeah. As I'd left things, we have this explosion of absinthe across Europe into America, but certainly in Europe, the places that we probably most associate absinthe in its heyday, you have got the famous figures and the luminaries who are drinking absinthe, the likes of Degas, Toulouse-Lautrec, Van Gogh, Picasso, Oscar Wilde, later Ernest Hemingway. Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman. Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor. Kylie. Kylie. She was, a, <laughs> she was knocking about the place. Yes, you have a very popular fashionable drink trending on your hands when these people are drinking. Later favoured by, of course, Alistair Crowley. Yeah, indeed. He, he a bit of that. made quite a cult out of it, didn't he? Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Now, we've talked about how absinthe is normally served. You've mm. got to have your spirit and you've got to have your sugar over a spoon. And then you've got the fountain, the little drip, 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 drip. Drip, or a syringe or, or a plastic syringe if they got it <laughs> or someone to just drip with tiny tiny spoonfuls <laughs> but seeing as absinthe is not so tasty to most palates absinthe is quite an acquired taste yeah yeah it's not like deliciousness in a glass like a whiskey or a vodka or, or anything like duchess. that or the duchess or the duchess which is a treat. so good it's not only an acquired taste it's a little finickety it's finickety to to make so why is absinthe so popular well, there are plenty of artists and figures from the Belle Epoque who credited absinthe with opening the mind and helping the creative juices flowing. Is this something you're familiar with? Have you uh, heard of? Uh, yeah, ab- I mean, absolutely. Yes, quite famously for many artists and things. It mm. was... Immortalised in famous works of art, all mm. called the absinthe drinker <laughs> yeah. by Degas. You've got Picasso. Van Gogh wrote about it and, and, and painted it as well. There are legends that absinthe was responsible for Van Gogh cutting off his ear. Yeah. This is also where the green fairy legend takes off. Indeed. That you've got the green liqueur. The green fairy is going to live in the bottle and is going to feed your imagination. Now, before we get into maybe the downside of absinthe <laughs> and why we are always slightly afraid of it, let's let's stay in the, in, the, in the happy period of absinthe because we're in a happy mood right now because no. the absinthe hasn't kicked in and this is a delicious yeah, cocktail. I'm thinking this this is looking good now. Oh yes, the louche is looking rather nice yeah, here, isn't it? It's very cloudy. Well, I think it is high time for us to take a little pause, maybe, and sample a true absence. <laughs> okay, Nick, do you want first dibs? I'm I'm intrigued by this. I have to say, I've never had absence like this. No. Not usually a huge fan. I'm not an aniseed licorice mm. person. Mm. Um, so I'm I'm intrigued by this. So <laughs> Your taste buds have been beautifully caressed by the Duchess. <laughs> I think they're going to be assaulted now. Okay, dive in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, Christ. I have never seen Nick make that face. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm frightened. <laughs> I'm so glad you did that first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mm. Nick can't speak. No, I can see the Should time, I drink this? I, I have to speak for a bit now. A little bit. Not the mouthful I took. Okay, I'm sipping. <laughs> I'm laughing already. I can't do it. That's fine. <laughs> honestly, honestly, so, so it's you're fine. More, more used to the flavour than I am. I am not a licorice fan. I found that it's- very potent. However, I've had my fair share of ouzo over the years. <laughs> <laughs> no. <bleh>. That... <laughs> Is actually very pleasant. It's, it is. It is. It, it's a lot stronger than I was expecting. Oh, though so you now, can feel that you can yeah, feel the strength. I think that now I know I'm going to drink that as you're recording the rest of this episode, and I'm going to be in pieces by the end. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. I don't mind that because it's fun. It gets it gets dark and murdery from here on in. Take a nice big gulp of absinthe while we talk about some quotes of absinthe. Yes, let's do some quotes and myths about absinthe. Okay. Let's challenge people's perceptions of it. Now we talk about absinthe. With fear and trepidation. I, I, I think that's fear and trepidation. It's putting it slightly <laughs> harshly. I Sorry, feel. now that the Duchess has enveloped you in her <laughs> arms and you've been knocking back the absinthe, you know, it's fine, it's fine. Generally, when we have absinthe on the show, we have gone slightly insane. The, no denying that. Because absinthe is strong. It is strong. And some would say that it has slightly strange effects. Now, quotes about absinthe. One of the most famous by Oscar Wilde. Mm reportedly still reportedly after the first glass of absinthe you see things as you wish they were after the second glass you see them as they are not finally you see things as they really are and that is the most horrible thing in the world (laughs) sounds about right really (laughs) he also described phantom sensation of having tulips brush against his legs after leaving a bar at closing time i can i can feel it in my brain (laughs) i'm sitting here and my brain feels weird. I can feel it. It's not gone down to my stomach. 
the absinthe had gone up it's into my head. It's into your and head. And it's actually soaking my brain and I can feel it <laughs> seeping in. Very the, weird sensation. The poet Paul Verlaine said absinthe was a horrible drink and one which should be suppressed by governments. Paul Gauguin, absinthe is the only decent drink that suits an artist. Nice. We have poet and writer Ernest Dowson. Absinthe makes the tart grow fonder. <laughs> Very good. I will come back to Mr. Dawson at the end of this. Okay. But there is a little side note to this, which I have written in. You reminded me of an earnest, Mr. Hemingway. Yes, please do. So he very famously came up with the death in the afternoon. He did. His cocktail, which is basically absinthe and champagne. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is, yeah, not a bad way to go, really. <laughs> One of his many famous cocktails. He was. And he has another quote, which I shall save until okay. later. So we have a varying degree of feeling towards absinthe from the great and the good of the time. But generally, the artist <laughs> loving it. A few myths associated with absinthe that we are going to just dispel right now. Excellent. Not an hallucinogenic. No. Now, you say no really quickly. Famously, people thought that it was. I think I think any alcohol taken in sufficient quantity is an hallucin- uh, hallucinogenic, mm-hmm. really. You could drink a bucket of gin and you'd be seeing all sorts of shit. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, the same of absinthe, I feel. How are you feeling now that it's crawling into your brain? Yeah, it's a bit weird. <laughs> Not going to die. I'm actually having to think about my words. <laughs> this is the effect of absinthe. And maybe that's why there are all of these rumours and these thoughts that, oh my God, there's an ingredient in absinthe and it totally makes you go wild. <laughs> there is an ingredient in there, I think it's pronounced thujun, which people thought was very similar to marijuana. The, but all sorts of tests have been done. Let's put no, it to bed. There are no opiates. None of that. There are no additives. There is nothing that's going to make you trip balls <laughs> just by drinking a glass of absinthe. It is really just very strong. Mm. It is very, very strong. I remember vividly in the 90s when absinthe started to have its resurgence in the UK, walking around the supermarkets and talking to my big sister who was going to buy some absinthe. Oh, yeah. And we were talking very confidently that, you know, the good absinthe actually has some opiates in it. And it's like, <laughs> it's like really? And that's what all the artists were on. No, bollocks. No, no absolute absence. bollocks. It's just bastard strong, but it tastes very interesting. It tastes very elegant. Yeah. And they had, it had an excellent marketing thing. So that was all, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get, get people thinking it was something this really weird knob and other and slightly dangerous then mm. people are gonna go oh well i can try that <laughs> certainly in the 90s onwards yeah. that was the marketing ploy for absinthe but back then it was just a really really strong drink we can attest certainly that absinthe has an effect upon a person but that's just the way it's made and back in the day there's probably all manner of nasty shit added to it yeah absolutely you could have really pure good absinthe which we are privileged to be able to have today but back then if you are a poor struggling artist you're going to be drinking stuff that has had all manner of shite mm. put in there to make it look fancy to stretch out the alcohol and most of the hallucinations would be down to alcohol poisoning yeah. So, alcohol, the greatest poison <laughs> of them all. <laughs> Another little myth for American fans specifically. Um, some people do think that they cannot get good absinthe in America. This is a complete myth. You can get great absinthe in America. People think that it's only in Europe that you can get the true no, absinthe. You, there, uh, there's a big resurgence in America uh, on in absinthe making. Yeah. So, you actually, rather than just importing it from France or wherever, you, it's actually made in, in the States. And mm. it's, it's very well regarded. And you should yeah. invest in that because it's in Europe where the knockoffs come from. Because everyone's going to Europe going, can I have some absinthe? I want something really green. I want something really fancy. And people yeah. are putting dyes in it. People are putting all sorts of additives in it. So actually in Europe, you're more likely to get a knockoff than you would do in the USA. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of that is stretches from sort of the 80s, 90s, where it had this little resurgence. These companies thought, oh, people want absinthe. I'm going to make the weirdest, strongest, greenest thing they can find. Absolutely. Um, and it's shite. Mm. But people will buy it because it's got this cachet of being weird and mad. Indeed. So, but, I mean, there are, thankfully, a, a few good absinthe producers in, in Europe. Oh, yeah. But it's not cheap. No. You know, the bottle I've got there is, is about £50. Pounds. As it should so, be. <laughs> yeah, so it's really expensive. But it will last you fuck knows how long because you do not drink a lot of it. So. <laughs> not after tonight, man. So, so it lasts. Good stuff's worth paying for. Myth number three. No flaming sugar. Now, that mm-hmm. was a massive resurgence in the 90s. Yeah. Again, when it None came back that. in everyone thought you had flaming sugar it became linked well yeah it became linked with the bohemian style which is uh, two different entirely things but one of them is is linked to the flaming sugar i won't go into it people were soaking the sugar in alcohol Mm. setting it alight and giving it a caramelized flavor 
Which isn't a bad idea, but it's not pure absinthe. Absinthe purists will be, get that shit Absolutely, away from yeah. me. No, 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 no. You just have cold ice water, exactly as Nick mm. has done. So anyone lights a sugar cube in front of you when you ask yeah. for an absinthe at a bar, hit them in the face with a fish. Remember, it used to be done the other way around as well, where you used to, the, the, the absinthe used to be poured over the sugar cube. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, then the sugar absinthe was soaked into the sugar and you used to light it entirely the wrong way around of doing it yes um, and just done for oh that looks pretty it does and looks dangerous and dramatic we are here to guide you people yeah. should you delve into the absinthe world listen to us now while absinthe seem to lower inhibitions it's also credited with being the cause of violence being the cause of immoral behavior and the decline of society in the early 20th century it's just alcohol <laughs> <laughs> In the early 1900s, there were rumblings that this drink was responsible for a spike in violent crime. Certainly, absinthe was strong. We've talked about that. In the same way that if you have a tequila, that makes you a bit giggly to some people. Some people on gin, oh, I can't have a gin, can't have a gin. (laughs) A source I found, I believe it was um, from research by Barnaby Conrad III, who wrote Absinthe, a history in a bottle. One source of the time said, absinthe makes you crazy and criminal, provokes epilepsy. And tuberculosis. Does it indeed. <laughs> Get that TB from that absinthe. And has killed thousands of French people. <laughs> it makes a ferocious beast of man. A martyr of women. Hmm. Really? A degenerate of the infant. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> it disorganizes and ruins the family and menaces the future of the country. Well, this is true. What the hell is wrong with this man? Oh, yeah. That's a lot of drama there. The beast of a man, the woman's a martyr, the children are feral. The children are, yeah. Off of their tits on absinthe. Give the 12-year-old absinthe. <laughs> then we run out of water. Absinthe, that'll do. Exactly. As, as extreme as this sounds, this is the whole thing about the myths behind absinthe. Now, the basis for these thousands of deaths, no idea. It's very popular. People were drinking themselves to death in the street, as had happened for thousands and thousands of years where alcohol is concerned. In fact, the whole smear campaign on absinthe around this time in the early 1900s, not so different from how gin was maligned 150 years earlier. We all remember Gin Lane, the Mm -hmm. Hogarth painting, just as breweries led the charge against gin in the 1750s. Now the newly revived vineyards are yelling about absinthe because absinthe is outselling everything else. The vineyards want back into the market, take down the rival drinks. And what better way to substantiate these mutterings about the evils of absinthe than by a mad doctor testing the effects on some animals? I mean, that'll do it. Now, maybe this is one of my favourite parts of um, absence history. <laughs> okay. Before we get to the murder, even though we haven't even got to the murder yet. <laughs> this experiment was technically done, I think, in the 1860s, but it was championed much later when they wanted to get rid of absinthe and they brought back this research by Dr. Valentin Magnan, who gave several lab animals, guinea pigs, I believe they were. Some of them got pure wormwood oil. That's going to fuck you up. Yeah, which is n- not absinthe. No. And then another bunch of animals, some alcohol, probably uh, ethanol he was giving yeah. them, and just watched the effect. Now, the booze guinea pigs just got drunk, ordered some kebabs, text their exes, <laughs> whereas the wormwood guinea pigs had convulsions and appeared to be hallucinating, apparently. How they knew that the guinea pigs, the guinea were, pigs hallucinating. were hallucinating. <laughs> <laughs> the guinea pig... a bold claim to make. <laughs> the guinea pigs are backed up in their cage. <laughs> Wearing some tie-dye going, I don't know, I don't know. These results were then touted as this is the effect of absinthe. This is the effect of wormwood. The same effect on guinea pigs will happen to human beings. Mm. Everyone starts branding absinthe as a hallucinogen. Things really came to a head for the people who wanted to take down absinthe in 1905 with the infamous case of Jean Lanfroy. Do you know the story? I know of it. I know the name. Mm. I don't know the details. So I'm intrigued. Now, Jean Lamfroy was a French-born labourer working on the vineyards in Camogne in Switzerland. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. And he worked on various jobs to support his wife and two children. He had previously served in the French army and was known to be a hard soldier and a hard drinker. This story does have an unhappy ending. 
So I will put that out there now. Okay. Right up until that point, you just channel all your Mike Malloy vibes It's all here. been jolly and lovely until now. <laughs> On the 28th of August, 1905, he rose at 4.30 a.m. and knocked back his usual glass of absinthe to wake him up. Absolutely. Good pick me up in the morning. That's yes, a little, little water to chase it down. He lived in a farmhouse with his wife and children, also his parents and his brother. Jean and his wife had been arguing a lot lately, mainly mm. due to his relentless drinking and the cramped living conditions and that all the in-laws are living with the wife <laughs> And she's tired and trying to tend to the family. I imagine like a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory sort of thing going on. Oh, yeah. All the in-laws in one big bed. <laughs> in the, in she's the middle. serving cabbage water. <laughs> this morning, Jean was already grumbling at his wife. He's already getting at her about he's prepared to go out for his day's labor. He's saying, don't forget to wax my boots. He snaps at her. She's like, yeah, okay, I'll just tend to the children and the in-laws and everything else on the farm. This is fine. After he'd finished tending to the cattle, seeing to them, him and his father and his brother made their way to the vineyards to start their day. They're on their way, of course, they call into the local cafe for a quick creme de menthe. As one does. At 5.30 in a.m. Followed by a cognac and soda. Yeah. It's the continental way. It's that's con- how you start it, the that's day. That's what a continental bre- breakfast is. Heads to work. Worky, worky, worky on the vineyards. Probably <laughs> eating the grapes. <laughs> yes, Stops for some lunch, which consists of three glasses of very strong homemade wine, piquette, a l- little little tiny bit of bread and sausage. Yeah. Back to work, 3 p.m., comes around. Time for another couple of glasses of the piquette. Nice. Day wraps up around 4.30. At some point at this point, a neighbor comes over and gives him a glass of red wine, knocks that back, and he's like, okay, time to head home. Time to head home for dinner. Via the cafe for a nice <laughs> cup of black coffee filled with brandy. Excellent. So he's had a good day. He's had a very civilised day. I, I think no grapes were gathered that day. <laughs> many were gathered and many were eaten. On his all fours, <laughs> crawling like, along the like, vine. One for the basket, one for me. <laughs> one for the basket, one for me. <laughs> he was the cause of the blight. <laughs> we just got back on our feet, God damn it, John. When he gets home, him and Daddy settle down to polish off a- another litre of piquette. Nice. By now his wife is is tired. She is fed up. She's like, you have to go out and milk the cows. We have 20 cows and we have to sell the milk to the local creamery so we can afford to live. Could you just do that? Jean barks at her to go to hell. Milk the cows yourself. Calls for another strong black coffee. Okay, okay. He's going to get his shit together. Going to get out and milk those cows. Nope. He has a huge amount of muck. Which is brandy times 20. By now his wife is furious. She's having to sort out the cows, the dinner, the children, while her husband is just getting pissed. Suddenly, Jean turns and sees that his boots are still unwaxed. Laziness. Lazy. Lazy. What have you been doing all day? Starts to shout at his wife. His father is backing out of the room at this yeah. point. They fight. He screams at her. The father's kind of going, don't say stuff. I'm like, good night. Good night. <laughs> and like the wife ignores him. He's like, why are you ignoring my father? How dare you? And he tells her to shut up. And she replies, I'd like to see you make me. Oh, you would, would you? Oh. Jean picks up his long barreled rifle. Shoots his wife in the head instantly. Yeah, that'll do it dead christ doesn't get pretty from here on yeah now his father runs out of the house screaming for help to raise the alarm jean does not stop here his younger daughter runs into the room he shoots her he then goes in to his two-year-old daughter who was in a cradle and he kills her as well this is not fun i know it goes south very quickly Ah. it's horrific it's (laughs) it very much is inexplicably horrific at this point Jean decides he's going to kill himself. He has a rifle. He can't pull the trigger. So he gets a string and a loop system and basically sets it up to try and shoot himself in the head, but right. it just blows off a bit of his jaw oh. and the bullet's lodged there and it's not not mortal at all. And he ends up in the barn outside. He's picked up his baby daughter and just collapsed in the barn. So it's gone from ha 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 We're having a very jolly time earlier. <laughs> now you can imagine how upsetting this crime is to everyone. And what is the one thing that everyone focuses on? How drunk he was. Mm. But not just how drunk he was, that he'd had absence. He'd also had a lot of other stuff by the sounds of it. Mm. The authorities arrive quickly, too late to save the women and children. They take Jean into custody to hospital for treatment when he eventually wakes from his surgery and his stupor. He is taken to see his families in the coffin and he is weeping 
saying, it's not me who did this. Tell me, oh God, please tell me I have not done this. I loved them so much. Now, as the police and the psychiatrists conduct their reports, they discover that Jean was very used to drinking upwards of two and a half litres of wine, plus two and a half litres of the piquette, plus several brandies and absinthe a day. On the day of the murder, it is reported and very carefully written down that he consumed seven glasses of wine, six glasses of cognac, two coffees laced with brandy, two crons de and two glasses of absinthe. And a sandwich. And a sandwich. The all-important sandwich. This does sound like me on a night out sometimes. Yes, I go, I'll just true. have a tiny sandwich and that will soak up all the booze. <laughs> but yeah, you can see how much the man had drunk. That's a lot. But if he's used to it, he drinks that every day. You're going to build up a tolerance, I feel. that you mm. can, I mean, I couldn't function after that much. I would be on the floor. <laughs> crying um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point about building up a tolerance so it's it's a good thing to debate later jean is of course charged with the murder there's, there's no question that he did it he doesn't deny it but and his trial lasts one day but the defense the defense argue that the whole business is the fault of absinthe only absinthe absinthe alone they bring in an expert dr albert mayhem who said the defendant had a classic case of absinthe madness Jean does not remember what he's done. And they say, that's, that's a symptom of, of, of absence. It's a hallucinogen. Yes, yes, yeah, that's what it is. The prosecution say he had two ounces yeah. of absinthe amongst a sea of alcohol that day, in so many words. Yeah. I don't think they said it like that. But I wouldn't, I would credit in them English. if they did. <laughs> in English. In English. Why are you speaking in English? <laughs> oh, pardon. But it all fell on deaf ears. Jean was, of course, guilty. He was sentenced to 30 years in jail. He did not get the death penalty because he was intoxicated oh. at the time of the crimes committed. Three days after the trial ended, Jean Lefray hanged himself in his cell. I'm not surprised. To be driven honest. mad by the guilt of what he had yeah. done. Now, this horrible, horrible case cannot, uh, obviously is going to have a massive effect on society, but it is one that is immediately grabbed and championed mm. by the temperance movement in Europe. This is the story, if you search absinthe and crimes this is the one that comes yeah, out a million it, times the name over. was absolutely was definitely familiar so. yeah a horrible horrific act of complete madness is absinthe the reason for it mm. well the temperance movement would say absinthe is the root of all evil the people of the village and the community that he lived in had a public meeting where everyone denounced the drink the mayor saying that absence was the principal cause of several bloody crimes across the country it ends with a petition to ban absinthe in Switzerland being signed by 82,000 people. Boom. And a ban is brought in in May 1906. Absinthe was then banned in Belgium, Brazil, Netherlands, the United States in 1912 and France in 1914. Absinthe is never banned in Great Britain. No, never banned here. No, it's a common myth as well. Yes. Dispelling that right now. No, we've always been able to get hold of yeah. it. But then... Good luck getting any Me, at that exactly. point. No, no, one made, no one in the UK made it, so they couldn't get it. <laughs> no one made it. Now, was it right that absinthe was banned for so long in comparison to other spirits? Mm. Was it really the killer in the bottle that people claimed? No, absolutely not. Why do people still think that it's a powerful drug, that it's a dangerous drink and a tricky tipple? Production was not allowed in France, but after World War I, it was able to continue in Spain where it wasn't banned. There were also underground producers for many years Absolutely. of the spirits, not going to be the good stuff, but it wouldn't be until the 1990s where in the UK they started importing it from the Czech Republic. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Eastern Europe earlier. That's where they got it from. That's where it was still being mm. made. And there's a brilliant, brilliant write-up about the production of absinthe in the UK and how it all started by Simon Difford. If you go on the Difford's website, really, really yeah. interesting series of articles and he knows the people who did it and it's really, really fascinating. You've got England as one of the first producers, importers at the time as well though, when absinthe comes back in, you've still got politicians of them saying, well, we've got to be careful about absinthe because, yeah. you know, as a hallucinogen and it's the same as cocaine and we need to be really careful about its moderation. No one had looked into the fact that there's nothing to do with hallucinogens yeah. in absinthe. It's just another drink. But everyone believed the hype that was around it. Bans were lifted in France in 2011 and production for the true spirit could begin again. Now, absinthe is back in the fold. Does it make one crazy? If this episode is anything to go by. <laughs> but as far as we know, no absinthe killings have taken place in no. the last decade. No. Or have they? <laughs> Perhaps we should end with the most famous recipe for absinthe, as you alluded to earlier, mm. from Mr. Ernest Hemingway oh, himself, yeah. Death in the Afternoon, as he wrote 
Pour one jigger of absinthe into a champagne glass. Add iced champagne until it attains proper opalescent milkiness. Drink three to five of these slowly. <laughs> nice. And that is the story of absinthe of Jean Lavoie. That's a very good story. Absinthe, murder and mayhem. I like the stories. I mean, I have to say, there is nothing hallucinogenic about it, but it does make me feel weird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can feel it. It's moved from my brain to behind my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you do have that kind of. <laughs> I mean, I can knock back gin, vodka, rum, those spirits, knock them back, no problem. Yeah. Glass of that, I feel weird. Absinthe is particularly strong. Can it's got to be within the legal requirements. Leap into the kitchen. And Leap. Grab the, and grab the bottle. Okay, all right. I mean, I, this uh, is live, people. This is live. There's live leaping going on. Leaping, <laughs> Do you want another bottle for comparison? Go on then. Is there, is there a gin? Uh, let's get you a gin. So this is Le Fay. This is the, the go-to one. So bottle of gin here, 42%. Bottle of absinthe, 68 <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it is considerably stronger. Yeah. Um, gin, you're going to have a quite a large measure watered down. Yeah, absinthe, yeah absolutely. Absinthe, you, you ain't going to be pouring an absinthe and tonic. <laughs> Everyone has a spirit that makes you go a bit weird, but I think absinthe is universal where you go, ooh, <laughs> Oh my. Yeah. It is not one to mess around with. Oh, absolutely not. Nobody be doing shots of that. No one think you're a big clever person by doing, you know, <laughs> oh, let's do some absent slammers. Enjoy it and enjoy the kind of cool yeah, feeling. I'm not having any more of that because <laughs> I will be on the floor. I'm okay at the moment. You I'm crack weirdly on. okay. I think I had to focus on words <laughs> and that's the thing that's kept me sane, postscript, yes. to this story. I mentioned the poet Ernest Downson, you did. earlier Dawson Downson. The poet is a, a writer. He's not very well known, but he's actually from Kent. Oh, nice. He was born in Kent, died in Kent, uh, but was known on the scene. Um, <laughs> thanks to his heroic consumption of absinthe <laughs> and his general misogyny, he is a ripper suspect. Ooh. He is a ripper suspect. The basis of this, one? I, okay, I read a book. When I say read, skimmed. <laughs> found it buried in references about Ernest Dunson, who is, yeah, he, he drank a lot of absinthe. He wasn't a particularly nice person. Mm. Um, he was kind of scruffy and down and out, visited prostitutes, was a bit misogynistic, but was in London in 1888. <laughs> was in London. As were a few other people, I imagine. Got drunk, and it feels like I was reading a book. I won't name it because, to be fair, I did not read it cover to cover. I read quite a bit of it because it's quite short. <laughs> but it did seem to be mashing together the idea of, like, absinthe makes you go crazy. And this man drove absinthe. And then he also was in... He must be the Ripper. <laughs> a couple of books have referenced it. Maybe there's more nuance that I'm missing. Mm. Please tell me, Ripperologists out there. <laughs> Is he the Ripper? I'm going with no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, what do you think, people? How do you feel about absinthe? We hope you've enjoyed this absinthe special. Do try a Duchess. Oh, it's so good. So good. Very happy right now. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm feeling I don't, things might go south later, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried how okay I am. And I'm worried that you seem to have absinthe behind your eyes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mid- either, either I'm going to go out clubbing now or I'm going to collapse <laughs> into unconsciousness. You, Could go either way. Near the end, about five minutes before the end of the episode, Nick had that look mm, rocking back and forth like, okay. Oh, no, no, no. What have I done? <laughs> Tell us what you think of Absinthe. Are you Absinthe fans? Have you got access or ever had a really good Absinthe? Or have you had a hideous experience of trying Absinthe in those little bars where they're going, oh, have an Absinthe. It's really, really fashionable and it's really silly. Tell us what you think of Absinthe. Tell us what you think of the stories. What do you think about Jean? Really very sad story. I don't story. think anyone thinks good things about Jean. No. But again, the way it was used and the way it was manipulated, mm. this is really troubling, I feel, that you can just pin, oh, alcohol is the root cause of all problems. Well, that guy chose to go out and get absolutely hammered. And you made a really good point that he probably had a tolerance. Yeah, absolutely. He'd been doing that every day Yeah, for most of his life. He could ha- obviously handle his drink. Mm. And then decided to pick up a rifle and <laughs> kill his wife. And then actively chose to kill his kids. Mm. I don't think that's the absence. <laughs> No, no. I think that's not. the million cognacs and wines that he had. But 
Tell us your thoughts on it. Do you have other absinthe-related stories or stories from literature that you'd like us to recount for you at some point? Jump on the comments of this episode wherever you listen to your podcast. Please leave us a review on Apple iTunes if you haven't already. Join us on Patreon for more episodes. But as we've said, the most important thing you must do this weekend is mix up a duchess or another absinthe-related cocktail and share your pictures. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you oh, boy.